Hello, and welcome to One to One Mining Investment APAC Online. Today, we have Sophia Nazalia from Verisk Maplecroft and Lionel Summer of Wood Mackenzie here to discuss investing in ENP activity across the region. So, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for joining my colleague Lionel and I for today's presentation on investing on, in ENP. Uh, my name is Sofia Nazalia, and I'll be taking you through the first half of the presentation before passing it on to Lionel. So, I'm an Asia analyst with Veris Maplecroft here in Singapore, and I look primarily at political, regulatory, and social risks with a focus on Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, the Philippines, and India. Um, but also through the broader Asia-Pacific region. So just moving on to my second slide here. Uh, Veris Maplecroft is a risk consultancy firm providing research solutions and consulting services designed to provide our clients with a holistic view of their above ground risks. With our clients in the oil and gas sector, we've provided data, insights, analysis, on political, regulatory, uh, economic, security, social, and environmental risks. So our work is heavily data-driven uh, with more than 160 above-ground risk uh, indices that basically quantify risk from a scale of zero to 10. So think of it like grading in school, uh, you know, the lower the grade, the higher the risk level, and the higher the grade, the lower risk level. So uh, let me just dive in straight into our presentation on investing in ENP activity across the region. So clearly now is an immensely difficult time for all sectors, not least for oil and gas. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, slumping oil prices and ongoing geopolitical rivalries present significant challenges uh, for the entire industry. So COVID-19 is definitely by uh, far and beyond the biggest challenge facing companies at the moment. So we thought that it might be interesting uh, in our presentation today to take you through our analysis of the capacity of key oil producers in APAC for recovery uh, once they begin to emerge out of this uh, pandemic. So we'll be doing this by assessing country risk through our newly developed recovery capacity index, which really in a nutshell looks at countries' fundamental characteristics of resilience. So the recovery capacity index looks at uh, underlying structural factors that play a role in determining medium to long term resilience um, and is built on five pillars. So you, as you can see here on the slide, it's built on economic dynamism, strength of institutions, uh, population sensitivity, connectivity and compounding factors. Um, you'll also see here in the slide deck the visual uh, where that shows the risk categories across the globe. So as you can see in APEC, while, while most of uh, Asia Pacific records medium risk scores, it's still a mixed picture um, across uh, the region. Uh, we see high risk scores in Bangladesh, Cambodia and Laos, for example, uh, but also, you know, unsurprisingly, Australia and New Zealand recording uh, low risk scores. Um, I'll be talking about uh, specific countries in more detail a bit later on. And I think it's just important um, at this point to note that while we've put together this index in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the data that we have captured here does not include data on response measures implemented by governments or data about the pandemic itself. So what really this index does is to assess just how well a country can bounce back um, so to speak, following an event such as the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, just looking at a uh, breakdown of uh, regional recovery capacity scores, um, you know, East Asia in this instance refers to China, Japan, South Korea, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and all of Southeast Asia, uh, while Southern Asia, and you can see in the second uh, row at the bottom there, uh, refers to India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. And you'll see here that, you know, this region, Southern Asia, South Asia, uh, records the second poorest regional score uh, behind Sub-Saharan Africa. And, uh, you know, across the five pillars, uh, as I've mentioned, that make up the index, you'll see that while South Asia's uh, economic dynamism will be a crucial component in its uh, recovery capacity, 
um, you know, the scores or the region's resilience uh, is also tempered by governance challenges, uh, population vulnerability, and other issues, including you know, civil unrest, uh, natural hazards threats, um, and uh, regional conflicts. But for today's presentation, um, I'd like to focus on these four specific uh, countries in Asia Pacific. So Australia, uh, China, Malaysia, and Indonesia. Uh, my colleague will later provide his insight, um, you know, a little bit more about these countries. But you'll see in the figure on the slide here that aside from Australia that scores as low risk, the, the other three countries are categorized as medium risk. So Indonesia here, you can see records the tail end of the medium risk score at 5.11. Uh, and of course, it's essential to note that while all countries will face hurdles in their uh, respective recovery, irrespective of you know, a risk score, uh, that the recovery timeline will vary for each country. Um, and of course, this is highly dependent on where they are on the pandemic curve, as well as the response measures implemented. So um, I just like to talk a little bit more about Indonesia and Malaysia. So this is quite a good example of uh, two quite divergent scenarios uh, facing both countries. So while Indonesia avoided a national lockdown, uh, unlike Malaysia, um, we did see Jakarta and other large cities implement lockdown restrictions. Um, as these two countries start to gradually uh, head towards reopening their economies, uh, continued uncertainty regarding you know, how the virus uh, will progress um, and the resultant adverse uh, socioeconomic impacts will present downward risks for investors and business. So while Indonesia was initially slow to react to the COVID-19 outbreak, um, you know, and particularly in comparison to its regional neighbors like Singapore or Malaysia, um, you know, it's now to the page, it's taking it a little bit more seriously. But as we've mentioned, you know, Indonesia avoided national lockdown because such a response uh, would put the economy at a complete uh, standstill, something that the emerging economy just cannot afford to do with its significant informal workforce. Um, while it's resisted, you know, hyper-restrictive measures, this has obviously had a trade-off. Uh, we see Indonesia recording the highest number of COVID-19 related deaths in uh, all of Southeast Asia. Uh, reported case numbers are not necessarily an accurate reflection of the actual number of cases on the ground, um, as testing is and probably will be, um, will likely remain to be incredibly low um, in the country. In terms of fiscal stimulus uh, response, Indonesia's previously limited fiscal space has now been expanded uh, by the temporary suspension of its 3% uh, deficit ceiling. So this, along with its comparatively low uh, debt burden, allows a fair degree of fiscal space uh, for the government to react to the crisis. However, government plans for you know, so-called business as usual by the end of Q3, we believe is quite premature. Uh, particularly as the curve um, has not yet been flattened. But in Indonesia, you know, again, the question of being able to keep the economic engine going so that its population can continue to earn livelihoods, uh, really, we believe, is at the center of this decision. So a lengthy lockdown will have you know, far greater social economic implications that the country just cannot afford. So as mentioned earlier, Indonesia has the lowest uh, score for recovery capacity uh, out of the four countries that we'll be talking uh, talking uh, today, talking about today. But long-standing issues of uh, entrenched corruption, its extreme exposure to natural hazards, um, and high levels of poverty will detract from its capacity to uh, recover. So, however, the country's saving grace really is in its economic dynamism. Um, which lifts its overall recovery capacity score. So now moving on to Malaysia, uh, where a national lockdown has been in place since 18th March. We've seen the government take you know, far more decisive measures um, in curbing the virus in comparison to Indonesia. Uh, the downward trajectory of reported cases suggests that Malaysia has successfully flattened the curve. However, you know, now as the country um, emerges out of lockdown, the number of reported cases is bound to increase, um, exacerbating then the risk of a second wave of infections. So Malaysia faces uh, constraints in its fiscal space. Um, its current federal debt level of 51% of GDP is precariously close uh, to its self-imposed ceiling of 55%. 
So it's unclear if emergency measures um, will be taken to temporarily lift uh, this restriction as Indonesia has done. Um, but Malaysia faces really, face, uh, you know, really few other fiscal options if it plans to roll out more stimulus measures uh, in response to COVID-19. So either way, the economic outlook for um, Malaysia is rather bleak uh, with unemployment currently at a 10-year high. Um, however, Malaysia's score um, of 6.77, so that's medium risk um, in our recovery capacity index, index, shows that the country is perhaps you know, better placed in terms of medium to long-term resilience, um, especially in comparison to many of its regional neighbours, you know, such as Thailand, um, Vietnam, the Philippines, India, and you know, as mentioned, Indonesia. And, um, Similarly, while in Indonesia, you know, similarly, similar to Indonesia, while its economic dynamism lifts its overall recovery capacity score, Malaysia does face um, other significant challenges, and not least is its fragile uh, political environment uh, that the country is currently facing. So, protracted political instability um, we expect will continue in the next six months, and this will definitely impair the country's uh, recovery capacity. So with the threat of a uh, motion of no confidence uh, that the Prime Minister is currently facing and you know, alongside a reinvigorated opposition, we do expect this uncertainty and instability to further damp dampen um, investor confidence. And you know, additionally, my last point on Malaysia is that um, the risk of progress against corruption um, uh, you know, made under the previous government might potentially be at the risk of being undone, uh, depending on the outcome of the ongoing 1MDB trial. Uh, poor performance in tackling corruption will impact the country's capacity to you know, recover from the pandemic. So moving on now, uh, looking at Australia and China next, where by and large, you know, the virus has been controlled uh, with business resuming, albeit at you know, a slow pace. So in China, um, unsurprisingly weak global export demand will slow economic recovery. Um, as the rest of the world continues to contend with the virus, uh, weak export demand will continue, we expect, well into Q3, perhaps into Q4, um, hindering China's recovery. And while job cuts um, are expected and will likely increase social tension, uh, we expect that political stability will remain high. Uh, COVID-19 has reignited the Chinese leadership's uh, concerns surrounding energy security with the National Energy Agency issuing in late April um, a list of policy areas to focus on in 2020, which includes oil and gas infrastructure. So the disruption on trade and industrial activity that you know, was caused by COVID-19 is really the main desire for, uh, main reason uh, for this desire for uh, resource security. So moving forward, Beijing will look um, to increase uh, self-sufficiency of uh, critical resources, um, including food, but also oil and gas. Uh, so the government is expected to double down on um, domestic energy development and storage capacity uh, building to really, to really to counter its high, high Im oil imports uh, dependency. So, for example, uh, there is the potential for increased uh, domestic production in shale gas um, and storage facilities uh, development in Sichuan province. Um, and in our recovery capacity, you'll see here, um, China scores as medium risk and in particular demonstrates a strong level of um, economic uh, dynamism. Uh, in this regard, it scores second best in all of Asia Pacific, only behind um, Japan. And the higher risk, though, that may hinder China's capacity to recover are corruption and natural hazards risk. Um, however, you know, neither factor is really likely, likely to significantly impact uh, specifically oil and gas uh, operations. And lastly, we turn to Australia, where similar to China, you know, the worst of COVID-19 appears to be over. Um, of course, as with everywhere else, the threat of a second wave of infections is present, uh, particularly as the country starts to reopen for business. Overall, the outlook for Australia's recovery capacity looks positive, uh, with the country recording the third best score in our risk uh, index under recovery capacity for uh, only behind Japan and Singapore. 
However, Australia's dependence on commodity uh, exports hinders uh, their recovery capacity. So its high risk score on dependence on commodity exports index is second worst uh, in the region, behind only to Laos. So in this regard, it pulls down the country's um, score in our economic dynamism pillar. However, this you know um, reliance on commodities is not the only factor bringing down um, their ability to their capacity to recover. Um, their reliance on China as an export market leaves Australia particularly exposed to a downturn there as well. So, for example, if a fresh um, outbreak in China leads to another sustained lockdown, uh, that would have quite significant implications for Australian recovery. Uh, commodity dependence also leaves the country, you know, similarly exposed to any broader global downturn in commodity prices. Um, and another element that could impact uh, Australia's recovery capacity is the risk of natural hazards impacts. So, you know, cyclones, uh, bushfires, um, other natural hazards will remain um, significant risks in the country. Um, but again, although, you know, this is the case, you know, it's overall low risk score really indicates that it is uh, quite well placed to, for recovery in the next year or so. Uh, so that wraps up my half of the presentation. Um, I will now hand it over to my colleague Lionel Sumner from Wood Mackenzie uh, to provide his insight um, on uh, the current appetite of ENP investing in APEC. Thank you so much, Sophia. Um, I think just going into to the upstream and the exploration production activity that I'm going to be talking about, it's great to, to take that, um, that view from, from the, um, how the recovery capacity lens uh, and, and, and bear that in mind when you're looking at everything I'm going to be discussing here. So um, I think when, when we were first asked to talk about this, it was a very, a very different picture. Uh, and that was only a few months ago. Um, I mean, 2020 was really meant to be a great year. Um, I mean, aside from the Olympics and the Euro 2020s football in the in in Europe, where we have you know for oil and gas, it's going to be very exciting. So, um, quite a lot has definitely changed. We were expecting a big year for FIDs, uh, particularly in Australia, um, and the LNG capacity being increased there. Um, you know, lots of developments coming coming on on stream and and uh, new license rounds, but um, unfortunately things have changed. So I'm going to be talking more about around that and how this is impact investment in the region um, and the impact that that's also knock on had to to exploration in particular. Um, but I'll try and try and highlight some silver linings throughout to of opportunities um, in the region. Um, so, yeah, as mentioned, the world has definitely changed and, um, you know, with, uh, we, we hate to keep using this word, but it is rather unprecedented. Um, and the um, global investment into oil and gas, into upstream particularly, has, uh, has taken a large hit. Operators have had to respond to the low oil price um, and CapEx has been cut. Uh, globally, over the next three years, we're assuming and forecasting $260 billion worth of cuts. Uh, and coming into just the, the APAC region itself, um, what we're showing here is the um, uh, just the APAC capex uh, here broken down by region, and the purple line at the top sort of shows what we our Q1 data set, i.e., pre-crash our view of spend uh, for the next for the before um, from 2010 to 2030. Uh, you can see this large gap opening up now between. Um, what we were originally forecasting and now that we've we worked very hard to, to build this out from a granular uh, asset uh, bottom bottom down top up approach to really make sure that we're modeling this accurately and you're seeing a sort of an average over the next four years around 18 percent reduction and sort of maximum of 23 percent going down in, in 2021 um, so I mean, the, the main takeaway here is that, you know, this, this decreased investment um, around the world, but specifically here in, in APAC, is, uh, will have you know, short-term impacts to supply, of course, but there'll be long-term ram ramifications that need to be um, uh, considered and, and addressed at some point. Um, given the importance of, of these companies in the region, I think it's worth taking some time to look at the majors. Um, we'll also look at the NOCs because they, uh, the real powerhouses of this region. Um, 
So it's interesting looking at the majors and, and what their story was before, um, before they made their cuts and afterwards. So before the cuts, what we have here is a chart just showing the break even um, and the red, the cash flow break evens for these various um, companies. Um, and the red line shows the, the break even at cash of, of $35 per barrel. Um, so you can see before the crash, um, all these companies are operating, even their base business is, is close to or above that that line. Um, and they had ambitious plans of buybacks and expiration and, and paying large dividends to their shareholders. Um, but after the crash, um, we've, we've remodeled the, the, the cash flows for these companies. Um, you can see some significant impact to the, the buyback, the share buybacks, um, and their base business, i.e. the CapEx uh, expenditure that they're, they're planning. I think ExxonMobil is a real standout here. They had some really large counter cyclical plans of, of, of big investment and uh, they had a lot of assets that they needed to divest so their base business is just generally um, pretty inflated um, and even even after some hefty cuts that they've announced of you know, 20 30 percent of their capex they're still uh, well above that line um, it's worth noting that equinor and shell have have announced uh, some, their dividend cuts uh, and this is not reflecting the gray um the gray bars but you can see where with the red dots represent where they would be if they brought their dividend down to a five percent yield um so i think i think the key takeaway here is is they have made some significant cuts but um is is there more that needs to be done and i think it it looks like that that may be the case so there may be more to more to the story for to come through the year um Taking a look now at the NOCs, um, specifically um, the, the Chinese and the Pertamina and, uh, and PTTP, the Thai NOC, um, they've also uh, obviously had to make, make cuts and, and no one's been spared from, from the suffering of the, the low oil price. Um, but there is a, a difference in the way the NOCs have to treat this, uh, given it's not just the oil price, their local economies, their domestic economies need, need support. And they, these companies are uh, intertwined with the government and the governments and their respective government objectives. Um, so, you know, they have to focus on these national objectives. Um, and unlike IOCs, they need to make sure that um, restoring economic activity and maintaining employment is, is a key objective for these companies, additional to to running um, an effective upstream operation. Um, they also, in, in sort of, in part of this, they, they uh, have the luxury of, of strong finances and balance sheets are, are a bit more robust as they can look to state-owned banks and, uh, and leverage using um, you know, government finances rather than having to necessarily go to the public um, debt markets. Um, but what would they have announced cuts? And um, we're expecting to see uh, a lot, the vast majority of that happening in their international plans. A lot of these companies have looked uh, abroad to, to find additional resources and bring those home uh, for their own national security. Um, but a lot of those uh, expansion plans are, are sort of being tempered, uh, hopefully briefly. Uh, but we expect the domestic spend to be maintained as they you know, try to uh, maintain these national objectives um, and maintain the recovery. Um, so again, looking at their cash flows for these companies, the um, it's it's still they have made some some heavy heavy cuts, but it's still looking significantly above um, you know in this case the thirty dollar break even um, for Brent. Uh, so again, the question is, do, does more need to be done? Uh, looking at dividends, it's difficult for these companies to 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 potentially cut the dividends. Those are very crucial uh, for political reasons in terms of meeting budgets and, and that that money goes to to support the economy so uh potentially a chat more challenging then for the the majors to cut there um so capex you know there may be more to come not just in 2020 but 2021 um and then look taking a bit more of a deep dive on the expiration response to all of this um so Expiration, although as you can see on this chart, so that the, the yellow dots sort of represent um, the percentage cut for, for expiration for these majors. And as you're looking at sort of 20 to 30% cuts on, on expiration, 
Um, expiration is one of the easier areas to cut. It, it feels in the short term somewhat less, uh, less nece necessary to maintaining operations. Um, but the red, the red dots there show that the, the actual absolute uh, impact of cutting that expiration is relatively minimal. It's in the sort of low, low single digits. Um, but unfortunately, it, it, it is an easier place to, to trim fat. So that is where a lot of expiration companies uh, and majors will look to, to, to do so. Um, most of the sort of the pure play EMPs will be cutting uh, even heavier than this as uh, they don't have any of the downstream uh, diversification to, to maintain their cash flow and they have to, to, to maintain uh, some robustness in these challenging times whilst the oil price is low. Um, the NOCs have been slower to react. Um, it's not, they've certainly made it clear that they're reducing their international upstream uh, expenditure. So we're expecting um, the international expiration to also take more of a hit, but we're uh, assuming that the domestic uh, expiration programs will be maintained, um, uh, particularly sort of across China, uh, Malaysia, and Indonesia, um, where there are hopeful for some new players to be opened uh, and interestingly in in the last downturn high impact um, wells and those sort of frontier expensive wells were 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 hit very hard uh, and in, in favor of near near field exploration but this this time it seems that they're maintaining these high impact wells in, in a pursuit of those you know crucial cheaper cheaper barrels that are, are going to be ever ever more necessary going forward um, the logistics around um, coronavirus is is hampering uh, exploration particularly uh, there's a lot of crews crossing crossing borders and, and you need to change and, and get people from all around the world so it's been a, a great challenge for these companies to to do that but that in some ways provides a, a ready excuse for for de deferrals of, 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 of the expenditure um, which given the low oil prices actually can actually be quite convenient but um that is definitely having an impact on, on the way we're seeing spend um and it's i think it's worth noting that it's not just 2020 that um the slowdown is going to impact i think 2021 is almost certainly going to uh to see deferrals and, and less uh, less expiration activity in general um the long-term outlook for this region is certainly there's been a growing appetite for gas um uh, explorers are actively pursuing gas, not just oil anymore, uh, as this is becoming part of the clean energy portfolio for, for many companies uh, as they try to, to embrace the, the, the changing energy transition. Um, it's quite key for, you know, it's, a quite a, it's a particularly mature re region, particularly in Southeast Asia. Um, so there, it's very important that new plays are explored and new frontiers are, uh, are pursued. Um, and it's interesting to know that sort of majors and NOCs uh, make up now 75% of uh, that sort of exploration activity. Uh, there's less less space for those smaller uh, nimble players, but um, that may you know that that could change if the, if the right opportunities are pursued and the right fiscal terms are uh, offered by by governments. Um, so a bit more of a detailed look at the exploration in this region. Um, just uh, try and find some good news in, in what's happened so far this year. Um, I think one of the key, key discoveries, a massive discovery um, by Petro China was the Pengtan, um, Pengtan one in, up there in the, the north of the map. Um, a very large discovery, a potentially 28 TCF of gas in place. Um, next, it, it part of the lot, a large PetroChina basin up there. Um, although the recovery is not expected to be greater than 50 percent, uh, 50 percent of 28 TCF is, is, a, is a significant um, uh, resource. So, um, great to see that uh, coming through. Looking at some of the wells that have drilled, we have Shui Nadi in Myanmar, um, which we was drilled earlier in the year and, and completed. Uh, it's not clear what the result was, and, and there's a speculation at either ends of the spectrum, so uh, waiting news on that. OMV had an interesting campaign of a few wells in, in New Zealand. Uh, Tauhaki was, was dry, unfortunately, but they did have some success with uh, Tutuai, which um, is awaiting further, further details on, 
on the prospectivity of, of that resource. Um, I think appraisals is, is, was the theme coming into this year and there was ex really some, some exciting discoveries last year. Um, so we're hoping this year to see, to see those proved up um, with some key appraisals, ENI with Ken Bao in, in Vietnam, uh, the, uh, appraising that gas discovery, but we're now that Vietnam's coming back to a, bit, to a bit of normality, we're optimistic on that one. Uh, PTTP are still hoping to appraise Lang Le Bar in Q3, maybe maybe pushed out to Q4 this this year. Uh, it's really a massive discovery, the largest one they've made uh, in their history, and uh, hoping to. It, it, there's a lot of talk that it's quite dirty, uh, dirty gas, but hopefully they can prove it up uh, and, and commercialise that as fast as possible. Um, I think KBD with Repsol is is an exciting in onshore central Sumatra. Um, hoping to commercialize that in an expedited sort of two year process, but uh, yeah, an appraisal of that, that resource to see if it really is two TCF will be um, hopefully within this year. Um, I think it's just one more I'll mention is Renchong was um, meant to be an exciting play opener for Repsol in offshore um, Aceh, North Sumatra, Indonesia. Um, found out yesterday that they're going put, likely to delay that until uh, Q1 or Q2 next year. Uh, um, but we're eagerly awaiting as this is there's not, not just reps over BP, Petronas and a few other players are, are hoping to open up this basin. So, um, so I think I'd try and end on some optimism um, for, for the region and that there are, there are still opportunities to be had, but we have to be um, obviously wary of the risks and, and that the recovery that uh, Sophia and Maplecroft have been, been mapping there um, whenever we're viewing this. But, you know, this region still needs energy. Uh, Southeast Asia in particular is a massive, it's forecast to be a massive growth region, even in spite of um, the latest uh, global upsets. Um, so there is energy needs to be found, energy needs to be supplied, uh, and there will be a price for that um, and a reward to that. Um, you know, with these, the majors looking to, to potentially divest and, and leave the region somewhat, um, there's scope for these smaller players, these niche players who have uh, key capabilities um, in potentially, there's been a lot of success in the past of small players with mature field and end of life uh, um, production capabilities who can run these assets more nimbly and more efficiently uh, to get really great returns. Um, and th there's scope for, the, for those sort of players to come in and, and, and find opportunities now. And hopefully governments will be more supportive of that uh, type of uh, work. Um, I think the role of exploration is, is, is changing. It's no longer just go out and find, find barrels and they will be commercial. Um, it's estimated that about 50% of, of discoveries may, may not even be commercialized, uh, or the barrels discovered may not even be commercialized. So, Exploration really is, is changing and, is, and the role is now um, more around finding cheaper barrels and finding those, those resources that are near infrastructure that can be tied back and are, are definitely going to be uh, monetizable and uh, of, of value. Um, and I think, again, I've sort of touched on it a bit, but the, the, these serious divestment plans, particularly from the majors, you, know, you have ExxonMobil looking to divest out of uh, the assets in Australia, offshore Peninsula Malaysia. Um, Repsol looking to, to divest that, still looking, even in this difficult climate, looking to, to offload their assets in, in Malaysia. So for the right players who, who, who can find the balance, the right price uh, for, with the, to, to, to make these sales go ahead, um, there are opportunities there to be had. Uh, but obviously that, that challenge in finding the right, the, a price that both the buyer and the seller can agree on right now is, is going to be very difficult. Um, and so, and another thing is that there's, you know, we, we took a, a, a very interesting look at the, the impact of this low oil price on and how the fiscal um, regimes of various countries in, across the world and in this region uh, will be impacted and, and, and how the government take is then impacted. Um, and that a lot of these companies rely heavily on the, these revenues. So it's going to be uh, very important that these governments respond and act in a positive way to encourage further investment. Um, it's yet to be, it's still early days, but we're very optimistic that that will be the case. And 
um, and that governments will make positive change to, to enable all of these uh, points that I've mentioned here and make those easier uh, and encourage the smaller investors and, and encourage um, more production in the region. So thank you very much. Um, please do get in touch if you have any, any questions on or would like to discuss this further.